guys in just a second. And uh, it's all yours, Vic. Okay, so we're in Jeremiah 12 this morning. So let's, uh, this afternoon, let's pray. We say, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. Lord, we, your abundance that you pour out on us, Lord. And Lord, as we work through these difficult times, Lord, as we are separated in uh, physical presence from each other and from you, we are not. We are absolutely in union with you. Lord, and each other through your spirit. We praise you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in Jeremiah 12, but I want to preface study by reading Jeremiah 18, 11, 18 through 19. It just gives you a little context, because Jeremiah was being pursued and chased. They had plenty of evil folks that were trying to do evil things to him. So in Jeremiah eleven eighteen, he says, Now the Lord gave me knowledge of it, and I know it, for you showed me their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter, and I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let, its cut, let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name they remembered no more. So they were trying to get rid of Jeremiah. They didn't like his prophecies. He was... Uh, telling them things they didn't want to hear, like most of the prophets were. And so he was trying to, they were trying to get rid of him. So that brings us into Jeremiah. It goes right into 12. This is one of my favorite verses. That I go to, a little whining that I'm not the only one that whined it. So let's start in verse uh, 1, 12, 1, I'm going to read 1 through 4. It says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. You let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? You have planted them, yes. They have taken root. They grow, yes. They bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. But you, O Lord, know me, and you have seen me, and you have tested my heart towards you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. So Jeremiah is doing a little belly aching. He's complaining to the Lord. Why are all the evil people prospering? Why are all these things being uh, allowed to happen is another way to look at it. Why are you letting these guys do with the things that they do? Why are you letting them get away? And the difference is, is he inquiring of the Lord or is he challenging the Lord? It's okay when it's okay when you ask the Lord. To say, Lord, why is this happening? It's a different thing when we get so upset and we get so frustrated that maybe we start pointing our fingers and say, why, Lord? There's an accusatory, and that's where we need to be careful. We don't want to accuse the Lord of anything. He is sovereign, he is righteous, and he is holy. If something's happening, there's a purpose for it, and it's maybe for him to know and us not to know, but it's okay. So what's the difference between inquiring or challenging of the Lord? That's what we need to know. You know, it's okay to ask God about our circumstances or event or other people and what they're doing. It's okay to say, hey, Lord, I need to ask you about A, B, and C. It's another thing to say, Lord, in a very telling him what he needs to do. You need to stop this. You need to change this. You need to do this. You need to do that. We are not to be talking to a holy God. We need to keep our reverence. What I'm trying to say, we need to be always reverent towards God. And inquire, Lord, what is it you're trying to teach me? What is it you want me to learn? What is it you're wanting me to change in this, from this situation that you, quite frankly, are allowing to happen? So it's always good to ask because God does answer. And that's what starts happening. God starts answering Jeremiah, starting in verse 5. He says, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you. Then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. So what he's saying here is that, hey, if these trials are wearing you out, what are you going to do when the bigger ones come? Because what's happening is if we're letting smaller trials wear us out, we're probably trying to deal with it in our own strength, in our own way, in our own flesh. And what the Lord is trying to teach Jeremiah here, I believe, is that, hey, if these things will wear you out, 
I've got bigger and better battles you're going to have to fight. And you're going to have to learn to lean on me and me alone, as I kind of talked about the other day. It's God alone we have our trust. It's God alone is our salvation. It's God alone is our rock. And it's being reinforced here with Jeremiah through his trials and through his tribulations. So he's also trying to tell him, hey, you ain't seen nothing yet. You think these guys worried you? How are you going to handle when the bad thing, when the really bad deep valleys of your life? If you're in a little trough, what's going to happen when you find yourself in a deep, deep valley? And the bottom line of it is we're probably all going to get into a deep, deep valley, maybe more once in our life. But we're all going to have to walk through some of those valleys. We're not, life is just not a full of mountaintop experiences because we don't grow. We don't change. We don't learn to learn on who we truly count on. And the only one that's truly faithful, and that is Jesus. He is a faithful one. He is the one who will never fail you. Everyone else, as much as we say to our spouses, to our children, I'll never fail you. I'll be there with you. And that's our heart. That's our desire. But the truth is somewhere we're going to stumble. Somewhere we're not going to meet a need. We're not going to be uh, in a moment of compassion. We're not going to be compassionate. But the Lord is always faithful and he's always true. And that's what he's trying to teach Jeremiah. Look, if these things are worrying you, what these little foot soldiers are worrying you, what are you going to do when the cavalry comes up against you? What are you going to do when a row of Sherman tanks come up against you? What are you going to do when a whole battalion of, of uh, cannons are firing against you? What are you going to do when the airplanes come over and start dropping a bomb? You can just keep ratcheting it up all the way to the nuclear war. There's all these things that we're going to go through in life, from dealing with little foot soldiers to dealing with nuclear warheads going off in our families and our lives and our daily experiences. Who are we going to turn to? We need to learn to turn and trust God. And God alone should we trust. So God's saying, hey, you don't need to be worried about the prosperity of evil men. That's not your job. You shouldn't be worried of why I'm allowing something to happen. Why well, you look like if someone evil is prospering, they are getting ahead of the game, whatever. That's not your concern. That's for me, because we know that in the end, what their judgment is. And it is swift and it is final. And that should keep us to hold on. When we see evil prosper, is have the heart, knowing if they don't change their hearts, where are they headed? We're headed to glory with the Lord. We're headed to eternal, never-ending separation from God. They're heading to a completely opposite place. It's not us to be telling God when to impose this judgment. Think about it. If you were to wipe out every evil person in the world, what about all those that are currently that we love that are not doing good things what about our loved ones who aren't walking with the lord and so if he's going to bring his judgment as much as i want the lord to come and come now we all do that's our hope but yeah man think of all the family members and friends the co-workers all these people we know that need the lord before he comes because once he comes it's too late and so let's don't worry about worry about putting judgment on evil doings and evil people today because trouble for them, it's going to be swift, sudden, and judgment, and it'll be final. They won't have a change. I want to read Psalm 73, verses 17 through 20. He says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slip, slippery places, you cast them down to destruction, and oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when no one, when one awakens, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. And it's talking about the sudden end of their calamity is going to come upon them, the wicked ones. So we know their judgment is coming because the Lord tells us it's coming. It's not for us to be telling the Lord to be executing judgment. We're not to be giving God orders, in other words. We don't want to ever lose our reverence with him. It's okay to ask him. It's okay to inquire. But it should always be from, Lord, what do I need to do different? What are you trying to teach me? How are you trying to mold me? What do you want me to know? And let's always keep those into mind. So verse 7, back in 12, chapter 12, Jeremiah says, I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I have hated it. 
My heritage is to me like a speckled, speckled vulture. The vultures are all against her. Come assemble all the beasts of the field, bring them to devour. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate. Desolate, it mourns to me. <clears throat> the whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. The plunderers have come on all the desolate heights of the, in the wilderness where the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. <clears throat> they have sown wheat, but reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but do not profit. Be ashamed of your heart, harvest, because of the fierce anger of the Lord. What we need to know is and that the Lord is reaffirming to Jeremiah is their end is not good. They may look like they're having a big old time today. They may look like they're getting ahead of everybody else, but they are not hiding from the Lord. Their deeds are not hidden from the Lord, and their judgments will not be permanently withheld. But when it comes, it will come swiftly. It says, back to verse 12, the plunders have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness, in the wilderness, but the sword of the Lord shall devour. He will reap his revenge, his justice. Not really revenge so much as his justice. The righteous justice will be prevailed on the evildoers. We not need to be focused on them. We ought to be focused on ourselves. And what is it the Lord would have me do? Have me change? Or have me glean from a situation as opposed to focusing on all these evildoers? Sinners are good at what they do. They're sinning. As Paul said, so was I. So were you. So was me. I was all good at being very good at sinning. They're just being good at what they're good at. What we should be praying for is not so much for the Lord to cast judgment on them, but for the Lord to grab their heart and turn them to you. Return back to the God who loves you. Or, re or turn for the first time, maybe. Whatever it is, our desire should be to save them, not to be worried about their prosperity. And I know that's easy to say. There's a lot of those Christian sayings that are easy to say. They're a whole lot harder to walk through sometimes. They're a whole lot harder to be a part of our body, part of our natural walk, is to say, okay, this guy's cheating people. He's getting way ahead on money. He's doing all kinds of other things he shouldn't be doing. You know, our inclination is, Lord, you need to judge this guy. No, our inclination is, Lord, you need to change this guy. You need to bring this guy into your kingdom. You need to take this guy because he has talents. You have given this man talents that he's using for evil purposes or evil ways that could be used in your kingdom for your righteous ways. And so that should be our heart. And that's what we should always be wanting to turn to. Amen. Now, as we get on, um, verse 14, before I get to verse 14, I want to read 2 Timothy 3, 4. It said, for the time will come when, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The reason I want to put that in there is because there, there's a time coming in in the house of the Lord. And we need to come. We are not, we want to tell or hear that may be contrary to God's word just because it feels good, tastes good sounds good doesn't mean it's good because the contrary to god's word it's not good so as members of the congregation we have a responsibility not to raise up false teachers as teachers of the word we need to make sure we're divinely rightly dividing the word of god we're giving you the full true counsel of the word not just giving you the do's not giving you the feel goods about yourself because god loves you and he does love you but we also need to teach about the don'ts we need to face the realities that we have not arrived. I used to have an elder buddy of mine. He said, Dick, get over yourself. You take yourself a little too serious. Which is another way of saying, it says a lot of things, but one of the things it says, get a little less focused on yourself. Don't be worried about what somebody else is doing because they're getting something I don't have. Let's worry about and be proud and be thankful for what the Lord has provided. We live in this country. 
you're ahead of 99% of the world. I've done enough travel in some third world countries to know we as a nation live like kings. We really do. So the point of it is, let's be thankful for what we have. and not so worried about what some, somebody who's out there that we perceive as doing evil things has, has more of than I have. They got a bigger house. They got a newer car. They got a name. Let's just be thankful for what God has done in our lives and what he's continuing to do in our lives and his blessing us. Because one of the things this isolation ought to be teaching us, one of the most important things we have is our relationships. First and foremost, our relationship with the Lord and second, with all you guys and with our families. I mean, I'm how many of you guys I know, but, you know, I've got family in Texas I can't go see. If I hop on a plane and land in Texas, they want to quarantine me for 14 days. I mean, I had a son that had a horrible accident with his foot with a lawnmower. Can't go see him. Can't be there to encourage him in person because I can't go. What is more important? Relationships. That's the most important thing we have. And it starts with Christ and then it works out through the rest of everything else. But if we're focused up here, everything else will work out. But my desire now is stronger to be with my sons, to be with my family, and to be with you guys in my church now. Mm -hmm. To be able to give you a hug. To be able to come alongside you. I miss Miss Dixie coming up and giving me a hug every day in church. Just those little things you don't think about, but you think about them and what you're really missing and what are really important. So God answers in verse 14. He answers Jeremiah. He just lays out his compassion and his unfailing love. He says here in verse 14, Thus says the Lord, against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out of the house of Judah from among them. Then it shall be, after I have plucked them out, that I will return and have compassion on them, and bring them back, everyone to his heritage, and everyone to his land. And it shall be, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people, to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. He says two things here. He's going to restore. If you've been wronged, there's going to be a restoration. You may not be on this side of heaven, but there's going to be a restoration. And he's saying to all those people who are doing all these wrong things, if they will stop worshiping Baal and all the false gods of the world and turn to me, I will restore them too. Because God is in the restoration business. This whole Bible is about God restoring man back to a relationship with the God who created him. Because God created us to have what? A relationship with him. To have fellowship with him. You can't have fellowship without a relationship. So the Lord built us, designed us, created us to worship him and to fellowship with him. Now, that means that we should have a longing desire to worship and fellowship with the Lord. We should have a long desire to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should have a long desire to family to have have my Texas tongue going today. To have a fellowship with our friends and our family. Because that's what we we're built to do. So God's in this restoration business. He wants us to take this focus off of what we see in the world around us. Focus on me, he's saying. Return to me. He focused on me and my way. Why does he allow this to happen, right? People, we have freedom. We were built to make decisions. God could have made us all robots and designed us to worship him because we would have programmed us to do it. Would you want to have a spouse that loves you because she was told to love you? Was forced to love you? No. You want to have someone, your spouse in your life, your children in your life, because they love you. They make a choice to love you. They make a choice to want to be around. Whether it's good, bad, or evil, we were given the free will to make choices. It's not God's desire to have evil in there. Man chooses to do evil. It's a choice. That's why he allows it to happen, because we got to have a choice. And if the Lord destroyed, as we talked about earlier, if he destroyed all the evil that's in the world now, all those who don't know him would go with that. Because we're only saved by the blood of Christ. So anyone who's not saved by the blood of Christ is doing evil on the side of the Lord. There is a separation. 
So we know there's still those folks that the Lord is trying to find, even through COVID-19, maybe through Zoom, however it takes place. The Lord is not surprised at what's going on. But the Lord is still looking for the last soul that's coming to his kingdom before he returns. And so till then, let's keep going. The other reason why is let this stuff go on, adversity builds character. And it builds, strengthens your faith. Okay, think about this. If we're going to change, sometimes we got to go through some hard stuff because we won't change on our own. Because it's something good that we like, we'll tend to hang on to it a lot harder, even if it's not necessarily what the Lord wants you to do. So sometimes he's got to work a little harder to dig something cried out of our hands than to just let us go on. It's our own good. It's character building. And, and when we go through these valleys, when we go through these deep, deep valleys, and let's face it, some of us have, some of us will, some of us are. It's God alone. And when you get delivered out of that valley, it builds your strength and your, and your faith that you will be delivered. The Lord loves you. He will never left you. He will never leave you. So when the next valley comes along, you go, man, Lord, I don't like this. I don't like where I'm at. I don't like what I'm going to go through. But I know one thing. You will be with me every step of the way. And I know that you will deliver me. I just got to see how you're going to deliver me. And as along the way, I hope I'm smart enough to ask, what is it, Lord, you want me to learn? What is it you want me to change? How can I grow closer to you? And how can I look more like you at the end? And valley by valley by valley, we build our strength, we build our faith, and we build a character, a godly character. And that's what he's after. So that's some of the reason you allow some of this to happen. Amen? Amen. Amen, guys. Amen. All right. Good job, Vic.